I started shooting meth the dream because I was on the street working every night. And I couldn't stay up. I'd go to sleep and I'd be tired all the time. So I would shoot two or three jugs in the morning, you know, and it would make me stay up. And... Excuse me, Susan, what you mean, working on the streets every night? I was night? prostituting. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Right, right on. And to stay up, I would take, I was shooting meth the dream. And I started losing weight. I'm, I done got it back now, but I was small as hell one time behind shooting it. My teeth got rotten and, you know, so forth and so on like that. So what? So I stopped shooting it, you know, and then I, I went, my mind just, one night, just, how you say it, uh, I just went out, my mind just went away, blank. Right. I woke up, I was in, in a Highland nut ward, what's that, D1. You were in a coma. I was crazy. <laughs> you was a low call. You was, I was low crazy. call. So my wonder, I seen elephants and elephants, and I was sitting in my bed, roaring, and crocodiles was jumping up oh, at me. Oh, you was in the DDT? And, uh, Big old yeah, elephants and things were coming at me, and all I couldn't Get stand no people that. around me. I couldn't stand the, the kids to talk to me. I didn't even like to go around my family anymore because that's, hey, that's this what man is doing me. something to you. So I decided I just stopped using them. I started using something a little heavier. I started using heroin, and I shot it about, about 10, 11 years. And I started, I got a good husband, and he was sending me a lot of money, and I was shooting it all up, and we weren't having nothing. And we still, I still don't have nothing, but it's starting to get a little more now than I did have. It's got a little more sense now since I stopped using it. Well, like, if you get, like, the way I get, when I get down, I get to a certain point, you know, like, I get to a certain point now where when I got to close one eye to look straight, I know that I'm, you know, messed up enough, so I know I'm down, but, like, you know, uh, I don't want to get no more worse, you know, because I already OD'd one. <laughs> So don't boo-hoo, yeah, you too you Gotta get a grip, right, culture? Swoop down, swoop down like a vulture The rhythms, they lurk in the people All funk game created equal Waiting for the beat to rupture Like the rapture, gotta capture Don't let the storm of life scare ya Get funky, let me prepare ya For the days of grimness and depression Hey yo, bro, here's your lesson even though the rain starts pouring, start reaching, start soaring. Don't stop if you do, you're stalling. Rhythm savior, hear you calling. Instrumental to be free, B. Go ahead in the rain and you'll see. The factor is the key, I mean devoted to the arts of moving But so get on up and think about what's yours I mean your culture and your laws I mean I'll label you a sucker if you're dumb and just stay dumber But stay in line and keep grooving If it's moving, if it's soothing Don't let a little thing like water keep it under Or the thunder, look at wonder Stomp to your soul, it's lifted Get with it, rhythm's with it Get inside the groove and get nasty, funky nasty, crazy classy Money is the first on the list here, it's the good time, it's the good cheer If you got the vibe, then ride it, don't hide it, provide it Drop, drop, drop down the pan, shake a fanny, cause it's handy, not an ante Rock to the roll with the hand down, get the low down, rhythm showdown The simple explanation is nada, make it hotter, thanks to nada if you wanna hear what I'm saying, clean your ears and just come on and groove.
paranoid uh, about my husband and uh, made several elaborate and very serious uh, plans to kill him, uh, which someday still make tape take place. I got him shot at twice and got him to attempt suicide once. And I was just on this heavy murder thing. I was going to kill my husband. Uh, my old man, who's been shooting speed for eight years when he hasn't been in a joint, uh, gets, he has paranoid delusions. I, I mean, people that aren't there, uh, voices that are telling him to do things, uh, people putting things in his food. I mean, he's clinically, you know, uh, insane. And, uh, the paranoia and the insanity vanish when he comes down. And when he's not loaded, he's you know, a really delightful, very brilliant cat. Well, the Bob Bitchin was like, you know, he used to go into a pool room or someplace, and somebody used to be dealing them to you. And I used to take maybe 10 or 15 of them and just be jacked up, and I'd be walking out here, and I might walk into a bus, you know, no telling what I might do, because I'd be so jacked up and I have no fear uh, uh, with me at all, so I might just do anything with the sticking up people. And I was just taking them just to get high, because I like the feeling. Cause was I was it easy to get, brother? Yeah, it was very easy to get. I mean, they, you were going to restaurants, a uh, uh, hamburger shop, anybody would have some jumpers. You know, that's all you wanted, something to make you, you know, uh, get up off of. But this, this is in Detroit, this is back east. Uh, like I dropped four starting out, man, and an hour later I wasn't coming on to him. And then I dropped four more. And then finally all of the shit came down real quick, like, and I was totally righteously messed up. Bob. And, like, I had to sleep, I slept in my treehouse that night because I knew I couldn't go home, man. <laughs> like, it has us so far away from the reality of the conditions we live in and why we in that position, you know? And then when we begin to like come on down away from that and get in touch with reality and see the things that we got to do to better ourselves as individuals and as a community, well then we begin to find out that we can't be effective in that function under the influence of drugs because you can't be doing any kind of constructive work on the planet Earth and your mind is way up in space somewhere. Well, it started when I, uh, my wife for some 10 and a half, 11 years, all one morning told me she wanted a divorce, you see. And uh, I, I didn't, that was, it surprised me. So I couldn't uh, cope with it, so I had to uh, start to have a breakdown. I went to the hospital for a couple weeks. And uh, when I came out, uh, I was, you know, wasn't feeling all good and couldn't work too well, so I, uh, went with my doctor and asked him for something and this uh, combination of uh, methamphetamine and pentobarb was what I what we came up with you see I got kept uh, taking it and taking it and two three tablets a day usually two I started off with you know? and it ended up uh, as we're in around the average in 15 or 20 and some days uh, taken as high as 25. I told him that I thought I was taking too much. He said, well, maybe right. So he put me, uh, gave me a prescription for something else, which is a mood elevator, but uh, it's one of these things that take 10 days, two weeks to work, you see. And by hell, by the end of the third day, I was about to go out of my skull. So I went back and told him this stuff isn't working. Well, he said, we'll go back to the original then and uh, he said, you don't have to worry about overdosing. He said, there's people that take a hundred times if that's what you do a day, you see. And uh, maybe they would once, but they would twice. <laughs> but I was so sick, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hardly walk. I couldn't, my tongue was thick. You know, reeled and staggered whenever I went. I finally got sick, so I went to a psychiatrist. And uh, he just, he took one, I was just walking, I wasn't in his office 10 seconds, and he told me to go to the hospital and get withdrawn that I was very toxic and uh, in danger of you know, convulsing and kill dying. You know? So I did. And you kicked? Hmm? And you kicked? Yeah. I mean, the, the, it wasn't, 
uh, it wasn't too hard. I, I'd been expecting a, a bad uh, scene, you see, right then. But uh, with all itself, there was nothing to it, and I patted myself on the back, and it, it was about three months later before well, it all really hit me. And then just, I just went all the hell, just a uh, real panic, uh, irrational fear. Just, I was scared to death of something. I didn't know what, you know, and I knew it was bad. That's all, something bad was going to happen. And I was afraid I'd lo lose my mind. I actually felt it all like I was. So. I went back to the hospital. This is the county hospital I went at first. Went back there. I'd been out about two and a half months. And uh, I was in about another 10 days, and I got out of there, and I was out about two weeks or so. And the uh, same thing happened. Just, these, these feelings come over me any time, day or night. Wake me up sometimes uh, out of sleep, you see. And uh, I went back in a third time. That time I was, I was only out one day when... Uh, I get high because I like to get high, you know. There's no really special re reasons, you know. Some of the reasons, you know, may be uh, problems at the house and everything, but, like, I really don't have any problems at the house. You make your problems at your house, you know. So, you know, you can't use drugs to, you know, take away your problems and shit. You just use it as a pleasure to relax. I started shooting meth dream because I was on the street working every night. And I couldn't stay up, I'd go to sleep, and I'd be tired all the time. So I would shoot two or three jugs in the morning, you know, and it would make me stay up. And Excuse me, sister, what you mean, working on the streets every day? I was night? prostituting. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right, right on. And to stay up, I would take, I would shoot methadrine. And I started losing weight. I'm, I didn't got it back now, but I was small as hell one time behind shooting it. My teeth got rotten and, you know, so forth and so on like that. So what? So I stopped. Shooting it, you know. Then I, I went. My mind just one night, just how you say it. Uh, I just went out. My mind just went away. Blank. Right. I woke up. I was in in a uh, Highland Nut Ward. What's that? D one. <laughs> in a coma. I oh. was crazy. <laughs> you was a low call. You was, was low crazy. call. Through my window, I seen elephants and elephants, and oh. I was sitting in my bed, roaring. And crocodiles was jumping up. Oh, you was in the DDT. And um. Uh, Big old yeah, elephants and things were coming at me, and all I couldn't Get stand no people that. around me. I couldn't stand the, the kids to talk to me. I didn't even like to go around my family anymore because that's, hey, that's this what man it is doing me. something to you. So I decided I just stopped using them. I started using something a little heavier. I started using heroin, and I shot it about about 10, 11 years. And I started. I got a good husband, and he was sending me a lot of money, and I was shooting it all up and wasn't having nothing. And we still, I still don't have nothing, but it's starting to get a little more now than I did have. It's got a little more sense now since I stopped using it. Like, I hadn't done too much into drugs, you know, before I went overseas. I did, I did a little bit of pot and a little bit of uh, speed, which more or less was beans. And I didn't get into drugs real heavy until uh, Vietnam, which they had uh, liquid speed over there in little uh, bottles. And it was very you know, economical and very cheap. And uh, the first thing I encountered overseas was Ritalin. Uh, they used to give them out in a bunker line during Red Alert. We were inside of a fire base. And uh, we used to go out shit in all the time. My, my first three days over there, we got, we was, you know, right after Tet. And uh, I was quieting down. But my first three days over there, my third day or fourth day, uh, Ben Wah got hit. And uh, they started handing out Ritalin. It'd be frightening and everything. You'd take them. So you didn't want to be falling asleep, but yet you wanted to sleep, and then you were afraid to sleep. And this was really a heavy trip because it gets really strung out. You know, your, your, body, your mind functions so fast, and your body gets so worn out, but yet you keep on going, you know. And these guys keep passing them out. <laughs> you sure. And you, you just can't get away from them, you know. After you get strung out on them, suckers, you just keep on. <laughs> I'd quit taking them, man, because I'd, I'd get sick, I couldn't eat, I couldn't even drink water, man. Was so, you know, like, I was just so tight and dried up. And like when I did crash, man, I got it to crash for one night, and I was up the next day dropping more Ritalin to stay on these red alerts. And then when I got out of the service, I just continued on, and I got to the point where I was losing family, and my wife and my son, my house, and my job and everything, you know, and I just couldn't handle it anymore, so I came down for, asked for some help from VA. 
And I look back on my whole two years in the Army and my, and my whole year and a half out, and I, ain't, I haven't got a goddamn thing to show for it, man. Not even a cent, man. <laughs> and, like, all my money went for drugs when I got out, you know, and everything. And <laughs> I got my good conduct medal. Yeah, it is. I got my Vietnam <laughs> service medal. <laughs> and hell, I used to go through a case of beer, you know, and just myself, just one right after the other, and my wife started wondering, you know, wow, what's wrong with you, you know? Are you an alcoholic, you know? And, but I wouldn't be drunk, you know? And she'd go, sure, I'm consuming a lot, you know? And I said, yeah, okay. And then I start coming down between the alcohol and uh, the barbs. I just, like, I'd just flip out, you know? I'd get really violent type. And I, I didn't mean to, but it was just the idea of your head being spaced. And the really thing that really, I think, scared me the most, though, was, like, I'd forget everything, you know, a lot. I wouldn't know, you know, what the hell I did the day before, and, and all I could really think of is, wow, where am I going to get my next, you know, bunch of beans so I can party, you know, and drink. But the reason why I came here, though, is just, I saw myself in the past three years, I just, like, flashed back in my whole life. And I was losing everything that I worked for. And actually, my wife, her and I talked, and uh, she was getting a divorce, and I have a son three years old, and I'm not, you know, I'm getting to be 25 years old, and I haven't been going anywhere, you know. I was dropping uh, Dexedrine and Benny's and, and Methadrine in the beginning, and uh, the tension and anxiety produced by, by the stimulant uh, made me want to come down in a day or two days, however long it took, and uh, I started taking barbiturates to come down off it. And then I start shooting speed, and uh, got to be pretty heavy. So I start taking more barbs, and then I start shooting barbs. You know. Oh, I'd never do less than three uh, to start with. As my tolerance went up, I did up to ten or twelve at a time. Uh, shooting that many reds, ten, y you naturally fall out for a period of ten minutes to a half an hour. You get up, you're groggy, uncoordinated, generally screwed around, and uh, shoot some more. You shoot that many barbiturates, you fall out. I used to put a pillow on the floor, because I'd fall on the floor. The first couple times, I, I hit my head. Uh, just escaping from reality. Whatever pressures I had at that time, or things that bum tripped me, and I got so that I just couldn't go to sleep at night. And I mean, I, for hours, I, I would um, just be lying there awake and wanting to go to sleep. And it's very frustrating. And then besides, you're tired the next day. And so I, I must have just asked my doctor for some sleeping pills. And I think I was taking Sicanol then. So that helped, but the only trouble was that after a while, I found that I, then I had, one wasn't enough, and I had to take two. Well, first thing, went to Redwood Park with a partner of mine, and uh, I got ten reds, ten Mexican reds up there, and I did all ten of them, and then my partner copped another bag, and we were handing them back and forth. And then my partner handed me four of these giant sized number three caps, like mescaline caps, big ones, full, Lily F40 second all, pure second all. And I did all four of them. And I thought maybe they were equal to the capacity of, say, maybe two or three reds a hit, you know? But they were equal to five or six reds a hit. And, like, I, they dropped me off at my house, and my car was parked in the driveway, and I looked, and it wasn't there. And I start running, I go, son of a bitch, someone stole my car, man. I wham, right into it. You so <coughs> know that you don't know what you're doing, Rick. Actually, it's, this, it's, it's the other stuff talking, you know. You don't, you don't think that, you think that you're doing the talking, but, you know, like the next day, you say, oh, did I do that? Did I do that? And one day, it might be too late. Like, I used to drop reds all the time, three or four reds, me and my partner. And, hey, I thought it was out of sight, you know. Uh, uh, a quick high, you know. I don't have to drink all that much. Five, 15 minutes, I'll be high. Then my partner 
He's gone now, grew up with him all, all his life. Now, if the doctor could have saved him, you know, he got in a fight and all this, and he not got knocked unconscious, but them, and them reds just took over. You know, he was unconscious and it was, you know, his mind was dead. He just never came out of it, you know. It's just a state of psychosis that I think the drug, I, I don't know, I don't know the actual chemical um, process of it, but I heard that the alcohol, it takes something like a year to two years to just f f filter out of the system completely, that uh, it takes longer than stuff to just completely get rid of, and the nerve endings have to grow back in all their insulation, and that uh, while kicking it isn't as immediately as hard, the process of regaining, you know, your full components uh, and have everything going and it's a long, long thing. But I, I don't worry about having sleeping pills in the house as far as one of the children taking them because um, I, if it were the other, if it were the uppers, I can see how they might hear about it and be interested. But um, uh, it just seems to me that they wouldn't be interested in, in going to sleep, taking them, and even though it does have this little pleasant effect for a while. Oh, real good. I was floating <laughs> about that far down from the ceiling, just walking along. It was just very... Uh... And then I wrote the term paper, and words you know i was just i was just really good I was, I was always a good writer but it it just you know i i just felt like uh i felt like a genius yeah, i really oh like if you know if, like if i feel something for a chick and uh it's hard to come out when you're straight you know what i mean but you could say it when you're loaded you don't give a damn man <laughs> Before we got out of bed in the morning, we had this tray that lowered from the ceiling, like it was the, you, you, you know, you wake up, you get off, you get out of bed, and then, like, any, anything you had to do, you had to get off before you did it. And, like, it's, you know, dark, gloomy, and nothing's, you know, happening, I say to myself, well, you know, maybe I'll drop a few goofers, you know, and get loaded, you know, walk around and wobble for a while. I had a second prescription of diet pills. Uh, after the first? Yeah, after the first. Well, same, that, same trip. Hmm? What, uh, what happened there? Did you try them again? Yes, they were different color. And I told them that the other ones, uh, I couldn't sleep. And so I said, all right, here's another one. They usually fine. Same trip, exactly. Only this time I only took one and a half pills before I knew. Again, I gave them to my daughter, not to waste money. And I really don't know what happened to her, but when I think that how I just gave those things to a youngster. Well, she was about 16 at the time. But if I'd known that those things were so bad or habit for me, I would have flushed them down the toilet. Well, I have six people that I counted friends who use marijuana. And they, true, they never did graduate to heroin. You know why? because on marijuana, they committed crimes of passion and were electrocuted before they got a chance to get hooked on horse. I don't know, man. You get away from me. You get away from me. You hear me? Because I don't care anymore. And nobody loves me and nobody cares about me. We have the marijuana odor tablets. This throws off the aroma, and you can identify the marijuana with this. And we have the marijuana plants for identification purposes and they're used in the schools and also in the police departments. We have three sizes, a 28 inch, 38 and a 48 inch. Throughout the United States, schools are being pressured into responding to the unprecedented problems of drug abuse. Many schools have reacted by inviting independent drug programs into the classroom. These programs are often presented from a point of view which many students find difficult to accept. Lecture to you. There will be questions and answers, won't there? Okay, I'll introduce to you Sergeant Odom now. 
Odom, I'm sorry. Odom, I'm sorry. Police officers are frequently invited to speak in the classroom. These lectures, which often stress the dangerous and illegal aspects of drugs, reflect law enforcement attitudes. It uh, must be taken into consideration, I think, that we police officers are citizens too. We're merely doing a job full time that your parents can't do because they have to go out and earn a living to support you. So therefore, we must have the respect and the confidence of the community and your support in order to protect your lives and property. Now, I mentioned that we gather facts and give information. It's in the vein of giving information that police officers and other people, teachers, many people go into the community and give lectures and give programs on drugs. Okay, if we could have the lights turned off, please, I'll turn the slides on. Does anybody tell me what they call these? What are they? What? No, that's not a roach, it's something else. We'll look at, what is it? Joint. Joint, that's right. Everybody tell me what those things are? What are they? What, clips? Right, roach clips, that's what they are. Hairpin, somebody said a hairpin. That's right, that thing in the bottom there is a hairpin. That's what they use. They use anything just to hold the, the roach with. Now, the reason they use the roach clips, they like to smoke marijuana down as far as they possibly can. Okay, this one, I don't know if you recognize, you can tell who that guy in the red and brown shirt is or not, but that happens to be my picture there, and that just happens to be the, a large seizure that we've made of this type of drug. Okay, now we're going to talk about something else, and what do they call these? Anybody know? Downers, that's right. Now, anybody know what a downer is? What's a downer? Well, it's something that slows you down. Okay, what is it? Makes you sleep a lot. That's right. This is one of the things there are the sleeping pills. And now the blue one. Anybody know what they call those? Blue heavens and blue angels. That's ammo barbitol. What about the red and blue one? What is it? Rainbow. Rainbow, that's right. Now when they take the drug, they will look very much like they're asleep. They're they're drunk. They're intoxicated under alcohol. But the trouble of it is, they can take one or two then they might like it. You might like one if you take it. That foot you see there is of a dead person. You see what happened. They burned the complete soul off of his foot, all the skin, because they didn't realize that he was actually uh, under the influence of this drug and was dead at the time that they were burning his foot. They thought they could wake him up. Now, from the opium poppy plant, we get the narcotic drugs that are given to people when they suffer from pain. Say you break a leg. Now this is what they use to prepare their heroin with. You say, well, how do they fix it? Well, they put a little bit of the heroin in a spoon, a little bit of the powder, like the brown powder you saw, into the spoon. Then they place a little water with it. Well, it won't mix up because the uh, it's not water soluble, so they have to heat it. They use, like the matches you see here on the, uh, on the screen, they use these matches till it gets heated to the way they want it, then it becomes liquid, then they will put it in the syringe. They place the cotton in the spoon. Now that cotton is supposed to remove the impurities in it. How come if uh, a doctor prescribes it to you, it, don't, it helps you, yet when you take it um, without the doctor's prescription, and you get um, ill and sick and things like that? Now we've got to realize that drugs are are good. Drugs are not bad. It's what they're used for. Now, it's the symptoms of the drugs, which could be the abuse of the drugs. This is a symptom. The drugs themselves are good, and they manufacture these things to be used for good. Unfortunately, there's people that find that they can get different reactions from them, and they abuse them. Now, there is something that we haven't even talked about, about drugs. The illegal drugs, illegal use of drugs, are against the law. Now, this is something we all should realize. This is one of the biggest problems, and it could affect you. You're in a, a group, and somebody takes some pills, and they pass out from the, don't run, don't run. Tell the police, if it's the police that come, tell them the type of pills they take. This is why so many young people die from overdoses, because a person will take a bunch of pills, and the group that he was with will get scared and run away. I would think that it would be better 
for any of us to suffer a little bit of trouble a little later on than for that person to die. I hope that I've answered some of the questions, and I'm going to give you back to the teacher now. Another lecture approach is to use ex-addicts. Gina, a former heroin addict, is able to involve the students in an atmosphere of free exchange by being totally candid about her past. I was a prostitute for about three years, and uh, I could not do it unless I was loaded. You understand? Like uh, the periods, like if I cleaned up and I was on the natch, say, you know, and if I needed money, you know, nobody could give me enough money to do something like that. But when I was on heroin, like I told you before, it, it kind of insulates you so that you don't feel, you know, your true feelings. It, things are kind of removed from you. So I'm just here to say, look at me, you know. Yes. The question is, when I was 14, did anybody come around and talk to me like this? Somebody came around to our school and told us the most fantastic stories. They said, uh, never accept an orange from somebody at a football game because it might have dope in it, and if you take one bite, you know, you're hooked forever. I'm telling you, I was so much against heroin until I saw, you know, my fella that he didn't fall apart. I was surprised, you know, that he didn't just crumble and <laughs> drop at my feet. And then I said, you know, they're, they're lying. It's all lies, you know. I, I wish, really, maybe it would have helped if somebody had just, you know, told the truth. Do you feel that by smoking that first joint of marijuana, that that made you try all the other things? I'll right? tell you, there are some people that started smoking grass 20 years ago when I did, and today they're still smoking grass, or some of them don't even do that anymore. In other words, they did not progress, you understand? But then there's other people like me that maybe have some kind of personality problem, some hang-up, more or less like we're more, uh, we're more disposed to using dope. You understand what I'm saying? So, like I say, if you can make like a, a really final commitment, no on dope, that's going to include marijuana, acid, you know, speed, dope, everything. You kind of just save yourself a whole lot of bother, you know. Maybe some people can smoke a few joints, take a few pills, and that's going to be all they ever do, you know. But then there's people like me. I guess in a way it, it's kind of like uh, alcohol. This, this is not a professional <laughs> opinion. This is just something that occurs to me. That like, you know, some people can be social drinkers and other people, uh, you know, got to jump in the bottle, you see. So it's, it's hard to say. Did I use acid in between? Uh, no. Uh-uh. I was, af I was in between using heroin. I was afraid of acid for a long time because... Uh, you know, I, I had heard that, uh, you know, you, you'll really dig yourself on acid. You'll, you know, you'll take a peep at yourself. And I didn't want to see me. <laughs> I, have, I have since tried acid. And uh, it was very pleasant. But, uh, you know, if I were going to use anything, I'm afraid I'd still go for that snack. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yes, dear. I was in San Diego this weekend. Uh -huh. And there is, you know, some way down here. And some girl was telling me about she'd smoked this weed before and she started hallucinating. Yeah. Like really I bad. Like that. just starting there. Or like she's having rushes and everything. Uh, I was just wondering if you could think of what would be... The only thing, thing I can do is relate it to like what I know what people do when they make speed or, or acid. They'll mix strange mixtures into it. Just so people will get a rush, you know, and think, yeah, oh, this is like great. You know, like these girls like yeah, or, that's or that's have that's you ever heard of putting strychnine in speed because yeah. it gives you a rush? Yeah. Strychnine's a poison. It's enough to scare me. What else? So how about uppers? Are people still cranking it away? And it's not. No. It's not like it, it used to be. I know everybody for a while went to a big speed thing, you know. That was the most prevalent. And downers, I don't know how anybody could even dig a downer. It was such... Next year it's worse. 
Yeah, isn't it an ugly, just they're like ugly pills. People get mean and stupid and sloppy. Why are people so dumb? I sure wish I knew. Because it's taken me years and I still don't know. <laughs> Why? Why? We could no more tell our parents that like, hey, you know, I've been flipping out or whatever. And I need some help. I mean, I could no more tell my mom. Right. Maybe I'll call on the floor if I said something like that. Have you ever really tried to? I mean, yeah. I, I oh, believe I you. Have. Oh, my the tears come on. The psychiatrist yeah. surrendered. Everybody yeah. 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 Full yeah. Yeah. Ready. And well, that's, that's tough, that is. But you know what? If you, if you really, like, want to save yourself and you really feel uptight, like, there are places, call where we are, man. Call and talk to us. As a matter of fact, we're oh, trying right, right, right now to, to try and get like a counseling thing going. Like if somebody really does feel uptight, you call us and just rap on the phone or come down and me or, you know, one of the fellows or the girls. Just talk. Because I know it, it is. It's important. You've got to have somebody. Uh, That's really uh, fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. It's been a pleasure. Because like I say, you're, you're all beautiful. Stay that way. <laughs> well, thank you very much, baby. I have to go home. Often, private organizations go to the schools offering packaged programs in the hope of deterring drug abuse. Students are encouraged to create local drug clubs with the help of a national representative. Sit down and maintain. You're going to have to talk louder. The reason I am here, I am national teen director for the only effective narcotic education and prevention organization in the United States for and by young people. These young people are doing something. This is the now generation and they're proving it. As we say, those that leave have the disease called apathy. Let them go. The organization was started primarily as a challenge. And the challenge was nothing could be done about the drug problem. We only offer as a national organization suggestions you run the chapter or club. You would have to have a teacher advisor, but they work in an advisory capacity only, not a dictatorship. What you would do at the meetings would be primarily up to you. We have suggested methods like I said, but the only per people that have anything to do with having these suggested methods work would be you. And this is why I'm down here, to give you an idea that there is a program like this. It is available to you if you want to do it. Or like I said before, you can use the excuse called apathy. Apathy is the disease that it can't happen to me, it can't affect me, it's somebody else's problem. Why worry about it? Because I love myself so much I haven't got time. That's uncool. You may not realize it, but we've just played a ball game. I've just passed the ball to every one of you. And you can sit there and suck your thumb and drool all over yourself and be a bunch of little snithering idiots. Or you can catch it and tuck it under your arm and do something. Get involved. Quit passing the buck. Help your other friends and peers get rid of the problem called drug abuse so you can go on and have a better and bigger problems to challenge you next time. Um. Yes. Don't you think a lot of the students who are really taking drugs are going to think that it's a big best to not come to any of these sessions? You've just got to make sure that word gets around that you're not Junior Nard. You're not. You haven't got the training, the ability, or the intelligence. Sharon Lanham certainly is able to get down to the level that these kids understand. She talks their language, does it very effectively. Hardly no kids pay attention. They were just talking to their friends. Well, I think it was enthusiastically received by most of the students that were there. About half the people just walked out and just left. How come? It, it was just disinteresting to them. It just started getting boring. Despite their efforts, most independent drug programs lack genuine student interest. Others have found that a successful approach depends on the initiative of the students themselves. In a three-day seminar at a rehabilitation center, High school students met with ex-addicts to discuss drug abuse, current programs, and possible alternatives. You see it everywhere, you know. You see posters about drugs, psychedelic shops are in every neighborhood. And they're advocating the use of drugs. 
Now, how do you see it? Now, I've told you that it, is, it does create a problem. Now, what problem do you see through the use of drugs? Can you have that much foresight? Well, we've already got the problem. We're stuck with it. We've got to find some solution at this point, some program that we can set up at our schools. Yeah. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah, because, like, you have your own program here, and it's fine, you know, but, like, you're really, I mean, you were, in, you were an addicted to, you know, like, heroin and everything, but people at school, like, they're on pills, and they're just starting, and, you know, I mean, you have to catch this thing before they get there. And you have to make sure that any presentation that's made is always factual, because, you know, you just start telling people, if you say, like, you know, well, Marijuana definitely leads to heroin. That you, you've turned off 90% of the people right there, and, and they don't give a crap what else you're going to say. I've seen it you know, on TV. I've read it so many times. You know, speed kills yeah. and all of that. Okay. The pictures of the men you know, with their all arms right. all, you know, needle I'm arms. But I'm still interested in it. When you see these, these pamphlets put out by the police department, your child at this very moment may be on the, the brink of a whirlpool of death, you know, insanity. And, and parents read this type of shit, and that's all that it is, because no, it's it, not. well, but it's just, you can't <coughs> tell me that, that from, from smoking marijuana, you know, that it's a whirlpool of death that you're going to be second, it's, it's put in such a melodramatic way that people can't look at things objectively. I feel that any effort to combat the use of drugs is good. Now, it's not going to reach everybody, but nothing is going to reach everybody. It takes different methods, different techniques to reach people. Basically, you know, you've said and, uh, that if you, need, you needed someone to set you straight, you know, when you're maybe eating downers or smoking weed. And I think what we need is people in there who are willing to talk. Not, not willing to talk, we're willing to listen. The room which we have established here, which has become known as the RAP room, was developed as a growing awareness last year that the drug problem here on our campus was not yielding to the usual counseling methods or educational methods uh, traditionally carried out. But we tried to develop a concept of some sort of a way in which we could help these young people. And the room grew out of this. When I went into the counseling office once to discuss a problem I had, the, second day, the next day later my parents found out about it. I go in there and talk, and the counselor said, Dan has a problem, you know, it's got to be straightened out. And I mean, you know, I didn't want my, my people to find out just yet, you know, I wanted to get, you know, rap about it and see what I could do myself. You came here because you thought you had a problem, didn't you? Yeah. I didn't know what the problem was exactly, but I've realized what it is now. What is it? Well, it was like drugs were a big ego trip for me because like, I'd always been hanging around with people that were older than me. Like they were doing it in order to prove to them I was just as good as they were, if not better. I had to use just as much drugs as they did, if not more. And so I did it. I've been doing it for quite a while. Well, what are you trying to do, for one thing? Uh, I'm trying to get my friends to put down on drugs, too, because I but know... For yourself, you know. Well, what myself? You well, that's what I'm doing is for myself, because my friends quit. It makes it just that much easier for me to quit. Yeah, when it became known around the school that we were even considering of setting up a room like this, that we were recognizing the uh, severity of the drug problem with some of our young people, I found a lot of the uh, drug users, the heads, uh, saying hello. Uh, the atmosphere of the school seemed to experience a change just because we were trying to do something, even though uh, even now what we're doing is a rather minimal thing and still an experimental thing. But I believe it did have a positive effect upon the, uh, the total uh, feeling in the school. Hey, we live in kind of a state of truce, you know. That's what the best you can do with kids that are in this situation. But you don't use bad mouth, there's no use raising hell with them. There's no use pretend they don't belong. They're all citizens of the United States. They aren't going to be sent to Devil's Island. They're going to become citizens one way or another. And the best we can do is help them get into a mood to, to get out of this thing, you know.
In the shadows of modern Manhattan, surrounded by glass and steel, yet only a subway stop away from the seething city, with its crowds of people, hectic workday schedules, and the office routines, lies the sleepy village called Greenwich. A suburban oasis where one can gather thoughts and enjoy the wonders of nature. Or saunter through winding streets. Among handsome churches inlaid with antiquity and houses weathered as wrinkled crones, and through courtyards stippled with the light and shade of centuries. Here, thousands of people live in an atmosphere much like the one they left in their own hometown. Village life is cosmopolitan, yet relaxed and carefree. Pleasure is found in just being alive. Suburban living on an urban landscape. A time to pursue personal pleasures. To find self-expression in comfortable clothing. The tempo is leisurely, and cotton's casual appeal is in step with carefree living. Worldly worries are laid aside, and time is spent on decorating the home, making repairs, minding the laundry, browsing through antique shops for a possible bargain, or discovering a rare volume in a quaint bookstore. or shopping in the world-famous Bleecker Street Market, alive with the carnival colors of old-world piazzas. With the chores complete, it's time for a few relaxing moments in one of the many popular sidewalk cafes. Freed from conservative business attire, the modern villager finds comfort in cotton corduroy, the fabric woven for the now generation. As ruggedly appealing as the great outdoors, yet sophisticatedly shaped for the modes of cosmopolitan life. Greenwich Village has long been a clothes capital. From the early days of our country, village styles have been avant-garde, always a step or so before their time. Contemporary as today, new as tomorrow. For casual wear, carefree cotton has been the fabric most preferred by designers for this most creative of communities. Night fall, creating a world of contradiction of paradoxes in life. The tourist is lured by a sense of adventure in losing himself in a modern casbah, while the resident prefers an evening spent at a theater off Broadway, where the actors and audience share their common experiences after each performance. early dinner in a favorite hideaway. Or going to 
a party in the garret of a bohemian friend. Like any other small community, Greenwich Village has its town square, once a field for bloody Indian battles and aristocratic duels, hangings and potter's burials. Washington Square is now an island retreat. Here on Sundays, villagers gather for idle pleasure. pastoral setting is the American Arc de Triomphe perpetuating in stone the ideals of the father of our country. Washington Arch stands as a monument for all free men. In the old row houses just north of the square lived the 19th century aristocracy Behind these ancient gates, in leather-bound libraries and French-style drawing rooms, life was gay and frivolous. Today's high fashion cottons reflect the past in designer collections inspired by the young romantic look. Couturier cottons, frilled, ruffled, edged in lace. Delicate feminine cottons, recreating an era of fantasy, of pure coquetry, of sheer romance. Cotton organdies, laces and velveteens, resplendently radiating the nostalgia of times past. village is endowed with a great sense of history. Its brownstones, its garrets, cellars, and courtyards have been home to literary masters such as Mark Twain, Herman Melville, and Edna St. Vincent Millay. Washington Irving, Edgar Allan Poe, and O. Henry. Of President Monroe, Patriot Alexander Hamilton, inventors Thomas Edison, Robert Fulton, and Samuel Morse, artists Thomas Hart Benton and Winslow Homer, and others who have contributed to the American heritage. Today, Greenwich Village is the postmark for many countrified cosmopolitans. People who prefer small town casualness to rigid metropolitan dress for them and their suburban counterparts. Manufacturers and designers work around the clock to provide the cotton sportswear and leisure wear they demand for the country life. 